Um, we talked about these particles. We talked about all these different sort of things and how we could track them and how we could figure out their properties. And now we're getting into studies people started doing on some of the particles we knew about, like protons and neutrons. So one of the most famous ones that ends up setting kind of the whole stage of things. Oh man, is this crashing right now? Come on, yep. You'd, you'd think we'd be working okay with all this, but uh, sadly the file still crashes sometimes. So let's see, I'll have to reload that. One moment, please. Screen share is going to die on us. You guys can hear me okay? Nothing else died? <laughs> okay. Yeah, of course, we're getting to the end of the, the semester, so now all the technical issues start showing up, of course, right? Um, either that or my laptop's objecting to having been used for all these things for so long. Okay. Got that up, and now just to share it. And hopefully that doesn't cause any problems. Okay, can we can we see something here now? Hopefully. Yeah, okay. Okay, so in the 1960s, two guys came up with this idea. Uh, so Murray Gelman and George Zweig. <clears throat> and they both came up with the idea separately, which is kind of cool. So they came up with this idea that protons and neutrons, and if you remember our classifications from last time, both of these are called the hadrons. So if we go back to that classification, hadrons are interacting by the nucle weak, uh, strong nuclear force. Uh, and there's two types, mesons and baryons. We're not going to worry about the specifics of them. <clears throat> but they came up with this idea that these hadrons, so protons and neutrons, were both made up of smaller particles. Um, it was it was a reasonable theory like okay we had the atom and we thought that was the smallest thing and then we found electrons and protons and neutrons and then we thought those were the smallest things could we dig into those a little bit um, so they actually tried a couple experiments and the experiment they tried was actually a throwback to Rutherford's experiment so they shot electrons at protons. Now, you think about it, we fire a negatively charged object at a positively charged object. If it misses by a small amount, is it going to curve towards the proton or is it going to curve away from the proton? Yeah, we'd expect that electrostatic attraction to happen and we'd see it curve towards the proton. But what they saw was they saw something like this. Now these top two look kind of reasonable. Okay, it's curving. But then we get to these bottom two electrons and they're being repelled. So something weird is happening because something on this side or in this area of the proton seems to have a negative charge so it's able to repel things but somewhere else in the proton there seems to be something that has some sort of positive charge that's attracting them but if we if we want to balance it out we've got to still end up with a positive charge right so maybe we need two positive charges and one negative charge and maybe there's some sort of weird um, allocation of, of charge here, but it's not just one uniform blob. So this was a, a really big kind of question mark. What the heck is going on there? The, the obvious thing was, well, part of the proton is negatively charged. And they dug into this more and eventually they found out that um, protons and neutrons were made of smaller and from what we know these are elementary particles so this means a particle that is not made of other particles called quarks. Some quarks had a positive charge, other quarks had a negative charge. 
when you combine the quarks together, so if you considered the quarks that made up the proton, you'd get a total charge of plus one. And when you add up the quarks, quark charges for the neutron, you'd get zero. Okay. Now, you guys probably remember at some point I told you, back in February, the elementary charge, E, is the smallest possible amount of charge. We can't have fractions of that, right? And I might have told you we can't have fractions of that till May or June. So, quarks in the standard model, and this is stuff that you guys need to know. This quark stuff is stuff that's that's necessary for you to know for Physics 30. So you could see questions on your test <coughs> this week about quarks. Luckily it's pretty pretty easy stuff. Okay. So protons and neutrons and in fact all um, in fact all hadrons, so this whole family of particles <coughs> are made up of um, small elementary particles called quarks. We classify quarks by their flavor into six different types. Now, remember last time when we talked about spin and how spin wasn't really whether the object was spinning. It was like an intrinsic thing. It was a property of it. So flavor is where physicists got smart um, due to all the confusion about whether spin meant a particle was actually turning or rotating or not. Um, they chose properties that could be clearly identified as a property a thing could have, but ones that wouldn't be mistaken with other things that could be discovered. So they went under the assumption that a quark, this tiny, tiny, tiny little subatomic particle, we'd never be able to taste it. We'd never be able to taste a quark and be like, oh, caramel. Um, so that's why they picked flavor. Now, for those of you who can imagine what good flavors would be to name quarks, you might be surprised to know that the first two flavors are up and down. And the up quark, we give the symbol U, it has a charge of positive two thirds of an electron's charge. The down quark, symbol D has a charge of negative a third of the electrons charge. So yeah we have fractional amounts of those charge but it's okay because you know it only really shows up in quarks. Okay. Now we have this is the first generation so this is you know the the first ones that were stu uh, studied there's three generations. Um, this data appears on your formula sheet. So you don't need to memorize it, but you need to know to go looking on your formula sheet. The rest of the generations, you also don't need to memorize, but they're not on your formula sheet. So if you had to use some information about it, I would have to tell you that information. Okay. So the second generation, we have the flavors of strange and charm, symbols S and C. And again, we see one of them has a two thirds E charge and one has a negative a third E charge. And then the final ones are top and bottom. And again, the same sort of thing, a negative a third E, positive two thirds E charge, uh, B and T, used to be called beauty and truth, but the current convention is uh, bottom and top quarks. And so these are, are these six quarks. And then of course there's the antimatter versions of any of these quarks. So in any of the antimatter versions, well, it behaves exactly the same way as say a positron. The properties are the same, but the charge is opposite. So an anti-up quark would have a charge of negative two-thirds E. Makes sense. Protons and neutrons are made up of three quarks. Now I'll give you a hint. They're made up of three first-generation quarks. So 
if I wanted to end up with a charge of plus one and I could pick these quarks in any combination but I have to have three of them so I could pick down 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 for example I could pick up 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 I could pick up down up whatever what would be a combination of up and down quarks that would get me a charge of plus one yeah up up down right? Two-thirds plus two-thirds gives me four-thirds and then I subtract a third. What about a charge of zero? What, what would give me a charge of zero? Again, using those first generation quarks. Yeah, up, down, down, or down, down, up doesn't really matter. So a proton, charge of plus one, is made up of two up quarks and a down quark. Neutron that has no charge, one up quark, two down quarks. And honestly, this is about as hard as these sorts of questions get. I either tell you a particle and tell you its charge and ask which combination of quarks could make up that particle. I tell you a combo of quarks and you tell me what the charge of that combination of quarks is. That's about the extent of what you need to know for physics 30. Okay. Now, of course, we're going to talk a bit more about this. Of course, we can think of proton. Just going to write it in so it's in here in case you're reviewing later. That's up, up, down, which is two thirds plus two third minus one third. And of course, we know that equals plus one. Right. So we, we can see that we can add up those charges and, and it can it can make a lot of sense, right? Um, it's pretty simple math. In fact, this is probably the easiest math I've ever asked you to do for marks in physics 20 or 30. Uh, adding fractions. Now this meson baryon classification goes beyond spin. Remember we talked about how um, on this slide from last time, right? Uh, if you have a half integer spin, it's a fermion. If you have an integer spin, it's a, a baryon. And these mesons and bary, or sorry, boson and these mesons and baryons are grouped somewhat by that. As it turns out, mesons and baryons are broken up by quarks. So any meson has a quark and an antiquark. So it's two particles. Okay. Any baryon, these are protons and neutrons, for example, is made up of three quarks. And then any antibaryon is made up of three antiquarks. <clears throat> so an antiproton, charge of negative one, is an anti up, an anti up, and an anti down. Pretty straightforward, just the anti versions of these various quarks. Now mesons are kind of fun because they can consist of say a up quark and an anti-up quark. Right? Uh, and then in that case what would be the charge of that meson that consists of an up quark and an anti-up quark? Yeah, zero. Plus two-thirds from the up quark, minus two-thirds from the anti-up quark, we get zero. Okay. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, other fun things, we also describe quarks as having color. Um, again, color is not actually, you know, we're looking at them and going, oh, hey, look, it's like red or blue. Um, this is kind of like positive and negative, but for the strong nuclear force. So color is a property that determines how the strong nuclear force affects quarks. Um, through fun physics, um, Evan. Uh, so some of the various forces will allow those quarks to stay in close proximity to each other, um, even though they are um, antiparticles of each other. Um, many of those particles are not particularly long-lived. So they have a, a half-life associated with them. 
um, and in some cases they exist for a little while and then eventually the two quarks do annihilate and the particle decays or becomes something else or other weird things happen, right? So there's a lot of kind of strange behaviors that go on at this level of physics and um, I'm not uh, an expert on all the little like idiosyncrasies of why stuff's happening but basically it comes down to um, strong nuclear force interactions uh, in some cases weak nuclear force interactions um, but primarily none of these things are things that just hang out forever and ever and ever like protons and neutrons do so yeah it's I mean this particle physics stuff is is really kind of kind of neat stuff and uh, there's a lot a lot of things that we don't know down here in this in this range of, of information and there's a lot of studies still going on <clears throat> about all this but from our physics 30 perspective we need to know that if I have an up and up and a down quark, I can add up the charges to figure out the total charge. Right? Nice and simple stuff. Now let's take a look at something we're familiar with. Let's take a look at beta decay again. So remember, at its core, what was happening in beta negative? Like before we dig into what element it is, what daughter element we get happening, what was going on in the nucleus? Anyone remember what particle we started with? Yeah, we started with a neutron. And that decayed into what? I got two things out. Yeah, there we go. We get a proton. There's our one. Now we need to get our charge to work out. So that's where our beta particle comes in. And of course, that is a zero up top, but negative one. And then we got the antineutrino. Now let's dig into this a bit more because it seemed very strange for us that a neutron could become a proton. But when we dig into this a bit more, remember a neutron is up, down, down, and a proton is up, up, down. And so really when we dig into this, beta decay is a down quark turning into an up quark and releasing our beta negative and our antineutrino. So this is now the particle physics understanding of beta decay. We're no longer thinking just about a neutron becoming a proton. We're thinking about a down quark becoming an up quark. And this particular interaction is using the weak nuclear force is, is what's happening. Um, in this case is we've got some weak nuclear force things happening um, in this. Now it might seem weird, like you might go, well, this is no better, like how does a down quark become an up quark? But fundamentally we're, we're starting with so much of the same that we're just making a really small little change here. Uh, I'll also just point out, we also have an answer for why a neutron is heavier than a proton. If we go back and look at these masses, we can see an up quark is uh, one and a half to four ish MeV per C squared and that value I think is actually high compared to what the current level is. I think they've managed to get it a bit lower and a bit more well defined. And then down quark is about four to eight. So that's why um, neutron that has two down quarks is heavier than the proton. All these little mysteries and weird things that we're now able to answer. Okay, So you'd need to know this sort of um, or be able to come up with this sort of understanding of beta decay. right? That really we've got a, a quark changing from one flavor to another flavor. Um, we're getting those same particles out. 
you need to be able to understand and and explain or describe or at least write the formula sort of thing for for this sort of reaction. Any questions about that? So let's wade into some stuff that isn't um, physics 30. So I always find it a little weird that physics 30 talks about quarks but then doesn't really talk about much else. So the standard model was devised in the 1970s um, as a here's what we know about particle physics right now. And it's worth mentioning that even though it was defined like this and a great many particles that were predicted by the formulas of the standard model have been found. So the standard model predict the existence and the mass of a certain particle physicists were able to find that particle with that mass. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the Higgs boson, which was this very, very fancy um, particle that is believed to be what helps give particles mass or interacts with them to provide them with a mass-like behavior, um, doesn't perfectly match up with the expected results from the standard model. And so that tells us that our standard model isn't quite perfect. There's some other things going on. Um, we'll get to that. But all matter is made up of 12 fundamental particles and their antiparticles. So the six leptons and the six quarks. We've talked about the six quarks, the six leptons. Remember, those are the electron, the muon, the tau, and their neutrino components. The electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force, we've actually studied this. Remember how the electric and magnetic forces became the same force? As it turns out, we have found a way to, or, or we've found evidence that the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear force are the same force as well, which is kind of funky as well. Um, and this has led for a lot of efforts into finding what would be called a, a grand unified force. So a number of physicists are trying to come up with different mathematical explanations that would take this electroweak force and combine it with the strong nuclear force and the gravitational force. Because if that were to happen, it would mean that there's really only one force out there in the entire universe um, instead of these four or rather three since we know electric and electromagnetic and weak are the same um, and so that becomes would become very very interesting so far there's no further evidence uh, that I'm aware of that links the electroweak force to either gravity or the strong nuclear force but um, studies are continuing in that area and uh, we know that this kind of seems to be legitimate because of, again, this theory that they came up with for combining the two, predicted that a bunch of particles should exist, and then physicists found those particles with those masses based on further evidence. So, you know, when you when you hear things or, or when you predict something and go, ah, oh, I predict that this we will see all these things based on this theory and then people go looking for them and they find those things in the places where you told them they'd be. It's pretty good evidence that that's, that might have some credence to it. There might be some legitimacy to it. Right. Um, the electromagnetic force and strong nuclear forces are mediated by virtual particles. We talked a little bit about this last time. Again, remember you do not need to know for the test anything on this slide. So we talked about this again, but it's this idea of these mediating particles, photon, WZ, boson, gluon, and of course we think gravity might be as well. Quarks have a property called color. This is how the strong nuclear force interacts between them. It's kind of like having plus and minus charges. Um, opposite colors attract, like colors kind of repel. So you can have a red quark attracting a blue and a green quark. And there's a bunch of other fun things with it. And that whole area of physics is called quantum chromatography, which sounds super cool. Uh, but really, it's about studying how this 
color property interacts with things. So here's what your standard model looks like. You've got your quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. You've got your leptons, electron, muon, tau, and then the three neutrinos. And then we have the forces, Z boson, W Z boson, photon, gluon, and somewhere in all this there's predicted to be this thing called a Higgs boson that helps make particles have more mass. I'm not even an expert on how the heck that works. Um, but that's kind of this current understanding of things. Now of course I mentioned the Higgs boson that physicists found um, about six or seven years ago the initial properties of it didn't quite match the one that was being predicted so that means that maybe something isn't quite perfect with this theory maybe there's some other physics going on here and so that's kind of the big question mark right now is is what's going on is there more information to be gathered how do we refine the theory to match the data we're, we're observing? Anyhow, this is what we're all made up, is these quarks, leptons, forces, all this stuff. And really we're only dealing with, um, oh, I should pick a, a different pen color. Really we're, we're pretty much only dealing with these guys on any sort of regular basis. So, how do we know all this? We know all this, but how the heck do we figure this out? Well, as it turns out, physicists have gone all the way back to the Stone Age for their methods of examining things. They take the thing they're interested in seeing and studying and observing, and they smash it into something else, and then they see what happens. So we're going back to the smashing rocks against rocks method. Pretty close there, Evan. Um, so uh, there's an interesting thing that happens with this because energy and mass are equivalent, right? So you take these particles and you accelerate them a lot. And then when you smash them into stuff, sometimes bigger particles come out. So we have two types of experiments. We have a fixed target experiment. This is like Rutherford's, right? The gold foil is stationary. The alpha particles are flying towards it. Or we have a collider experiment. This is where both things are moving. You have one part of, bunch of particles. You have another bunch of particles. They are moving at each other. And then bam, they crash together. Now the cool thing is, again, when you crash them together at high enough energies, we start seeing particles with larger masses. So the uh, allegory I've heard is, let's say you want to study buses. So let's say you want to study how auto bus, uh, you know, like school buses or, or transit buses work. Um, but all you have is you have two cars. So from a physics perspective, you take your two cars and you smash them into each other at the highest speeds possible. And if you smash them at a high enough speed, a bus might pop out. And then you can study the bus. Which might seem really weird. That's because, of course, it doesn't work very well with, with car-sized objects, but it works great with particle-sized objects. So in any sort of collider experiment, we need high energies to see particles with larger masses. We also need these high energies to break the strong nuclear force. Right? So those gluons that are holding everything together, they're really holding everything tightly. Remember, they're, they're a couple of orders of magnitude stronger than the electromagnetic force. So if we don't put enough energy to break those, then they just bounce off each other. We, we don't get much out. Now, 
we can get some radioactive or high energy particles from radioactive substances. The maximum can, uh, energy of those particles is about 30 mega electron volts. We could go to space. We can get some photons and alpha particles coming in. Um, the issue is a lot of those get absorbed by the atmosphere. So you don't get consistent values. Uh, and once they interact with the atmosphere, then they get you get lower energy things. So if you want to do your studies with cosmic rays, you really need things like way, way up in the way upper atmosphere for your experiment to proceed. And that's a bit tricky to conduct science in. So what do we do? We went bigger, we went better, we went with particle accelerators. This is again something you should be aware of. This particle accelerator stuff would be stuff that you could be asked questions about. Um, not, not the specifics. So first accelerator was built in 1931. It was 23 centimeters in diameter. So if you think about it, if you that's about like the size of a really tiny plate, like a saucer or something. Um, it was a fixed target and it used hydrogen. So it used to be you could get a particle accelerator and you could hold it in the palm of your hand. Of course, that one wasn't particularly powerful. Earliest synchrotron, this is a type, but don't worry about what that means. You don't need to know the types of particle accelerators. But it was a 72 meter ring, operated between 1953 and 1968. The peak energy of the particles was 3.3 giga electron volts. So we're already about 100 times more energy than we get from radioactive sources. So this was a really big advantage because we now have a controllable high energy particle source. So we can now carry out predictable studies over and over again. We don't have to, I don't know, send up a weather balloon with our, our uh, experiment in it and try to then interpret the results coming in back from that. We jump ahead a little bit for those of you who um, I always like to include some Canadian stuff in these things. Uh, so Triumph, it's a cyclotron, different type than a synchrotron, but that's okay. You don't need to know the difference. It operates in Vancouver, BC. It started operation 1974. And it is where we get uh, a lot of the radio isotopes from that we use for say, uh, diagnostic imaging or cancer treatment. So, uh, some of those radionuclides, some of those things that uh, they use for those scans have very short half-lives. And so in some cases, they're actually flowing in from Vancouver the morning that a scan is going to be done in, say, Alberta. Um, peak technology right now is the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. You might have heard of it at CERN. It is a 27 kilometer diameter ring buried under the French and Swiss countryside, and it can hit a peak beam energy of seven tera electron volts. So we're getting, again, about 2,000 times higher energies than this guy could do. Right? Um, and I think they're doing some upgrades to it now to try to crank that up a bit more. So again, why do we need that energy? We need a beat the strong nuclear force. We need to break that. And so when we get into particles inside particles, we get even stronger forces. So we need lots of energy to rip the protons apart so that the bits of the protons might form these larger particles that we're interested in. And how do they do that? Well, because we have lots of energy. If we have lots of energy, remember, E equals mc squared, so we can get random particles popping into existence. Now, the if you have just barely enough, so let's say you were trying to produce a particle that had a mass of like 10 giga electron volt per c squared, well, you could get them showing up if you just use a beam energy at 10, but they wouldn't show up very often. <laughs> 
So if you want to see a lot of them, you need to make sure that there's ample opportunities for many of them to be produced. So you go, you know, a couple tera electron volts of beam energy, and then you can get many of them from each collision. Okay. Any questions about that stuff? We're almost done here. So, two main types of accelerators. We have a cyclotron, uses alternating voltage to accelerate the charged particles. We have a magnetic field that curves the particles, and the radius of the path increases with the particle speed. So basically your particle starts here and spirals out, and then eventually the particle collides with the outer edge of the uh, accelerator or some target that you have, and then you see what happens. And these are typically smaller, they're typically not used as much. Then you have a synchrotron. This is a, like the cyclotron again, same sort of thing, except you change the magnetic field strength as the velocity increases, and so your particle always moves in a nice perfect circle, no matter what speed it's traveling or how much energy it has. And with these these sort of synchrotrons and cyclotrons, um, so like the current one, like CERN and LHC, they can get particles up to uh, speeds near the speed of light. Um, and so that's where we start getting uh, that mass change. And this is also why physicists like to talk about things in terms of how much energy a particle has instead of what its mass is. And that is that. So we got that one test later this week. Um, it's been super fun teaching you guys because um, in many cases I've taught you guys a couple times over the past three years. Um, and uh, I really hope you guys have a good summer. I hope whatever you planned to do in the fall way back in January or February, I hope that's still a possibility and you're able to do it. If uh, you're not able to do it for whatever reason, I hope that uh, by next fall that's back to being a possibility and you're able to, to dig back into your plans without too much of a delay. So um, that's Physics 30. If you've got questions and stuff like that, you're more than welcome to stick around. If uh, you don't, then enjoy 